I'm all about the student doing the best thing for them. I try to find their path. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and today we are chatting with David Newbert, who is the former professor of bass at the University of Texas at Austin and has played an integral role in the ISB since its inception. And that's what we're talking about these few weeks on the podcast is the International Society of Basis, and we're bringing you content from the 50th anniversary convention. So David and I, we start off talking about Paul Dieterman, who even if you don't know that name, you've probably gone to his site. He is the founder of Talk Bass. And by the way, side note, he actually also happens to be from South Dakota. Uh, Paul and I played in All State Orchestra, South Dakota All State Orchestra together while we were both in high school. Hey, Paul, if you ever want to come on the show, just say the word. Uh, David also, by the way, grew up not too far from where I live now uh, in the Bay Area. He grew up in Monterey and then San Jose. We talk about these experiences growing up in the Silicon Valley area. By the way, Jessica Valls, a former student of David's, appears and we chat with her for a little bit. It's part of the fun of these live events. Hans Stern walks through at a certain point. He can sort of get a feel for this event. We also talk about David Walter and the Melodious Bass book and these things that shaped the bass world before the ISB. Obviously, there's a thriving bass culture before that, so we dig into that. The Texas Bass Symposium, which happened between the ISB years, Juan Luz, TCU, International Double Bass Festival, and the two schools of double bass that were happening in the mid-20th century, the Rheinschagen New York Philharmonic School and the Anton Torello Philadelphia Orchestra School. And also, David's cross-country career path, so many topics. It's so great to sit down and chat with David. You know, one of the major sponsors for ISB 2017 and a sponsor of Contrabass Conversations is D'Addario Strings. And we're giving away Kaplan Strings, 10 sets of Kaplan Strings to Contrabass Conversations listeners. Go to ContrabassConversations.com slash strings to enter to get a chance. And by the way, the founder of this whole organization, Gary Carr, did you know that he uses D'Addario strings? He does. I'm using them. So many people are using them. And I know that you would love to use them as well. So enter to get a shot to win these strings that are great for both Pizzicato and Arco. And thank you also to the Bass Violin Shop. If you're looking for a bass rental in the Southeast, the United States Southeast is a big area, the Bass Violin Shop offers a variety of rental options for seasoned musicians or first-timers. They've got long-term and short-term rental programs for every player's particular needs. Maybe you're touring with your group in the Carolinas. Maybe you've got a festival or workshop and you need a bass. Get in touch, bassviolinshop.com. Okay, here we go with our conversation featuring David Newbert. See, I, first of all, as a teacher, I'm all about um, I'm all about the student sure. doing the best thing for them. It's yeah. not for me, right? Right. And so I try to find their path. That's what our purpose, our role as a teacher, is to find their path, mm -hmm. and not it's not for us. And unfortunately, some of the teachers, you know, they think, well, it's all about me. I got to make them look good and then they'll make me look good. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm about. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. Uh, so anyway, Paul was a student that came. He wanted to do, he actually was kind of bored. He wanted to either do computer science or computer studies, but he also wanted to play his bass. Yeah. He wanted to do music. And I told him, well, you know, if you come in down here, I can get you a scholarship, but I can do it only, I can only do it in music. I can't do it in computer right. sciences. So he came down and uh, he said, okay, well, let's just go with the music. And I'm glad he did. But at the same time, I knew that he was really into computer technology. So was I. I was kind of a, mm -hmm. I've always been a computer kid. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's a whole other story. Where I, I grew up in in, in California, yeah. Monterey. I went to school in San Jose. Mm -hmm. I graduated in 1975. That's right when they were starting. That was all heating up. It was all yeah. happening. Yeah. Right. And it, everywhere I've gone, uh, it's always been a uh, like a, a bedrock for technology. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why it is this way. I'm convinced that everything happens for a reason. And but 
I don't try to make it happen. I just sort of let it happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the problem. People have problems nowadays, or, you know, young kids, they have so many options, so many choices. Yeah. And they're confused, and they don't know, you know, well, they, they're like, I have to this real specific f formula to follow. And sometimes, you know, the best thing to do is just you kind know, of let it happen. Yeah. And it'll take the course it's going to take. Um, so anyway, so going back to Paul. Yeah, sure. So Paul came uh, to study, and then uh, he was really, you know, he was a great bass player, super nice guy, you know, the friendliest guy. And the first thing I did, you know, to help him out was we had the Austin Symphony. I was the principal bass. Mm -hmm. And usually with these teaching jobs, uh, usually if you, if you go there at the university and you get a university gig, there's usually this, a symphony that's associated with it. Right, right. And being a classical player, uh, I, I'll talk about my jazz background but sure. it's not really I'm not a professional jazz player but uh, so Paul I uh, he you know I had him audition and he, he joined the Austin Symphony yeah and he did really well I mean it was he was a higher level turned out yeah he had gone to interlocking and that's where I think he really learned how to play the mm -hmm. bass mm -hmm. and he especially his orchestral and you know, there they're very competitive and they have the students you know compete for chairs well he maintained for that whole eight week period he maintained principal oh did he nobody, that's, that's nobody, saying you know, something at interlocking that's like that whole you I, know like like challenges yeah, and everything tell me about yeah it. <laughs> so I you know I knew that I thought well this guy you know he he's obviously in a perfect choice for yeah. the symphony and so he did he he made it in and uh, no problem uh, Peter Bay was our conductor and he was real happy to have him oh yeah and so then Paul then he was you know but he also you know he had, he had to supplement I mean, you can't live with a you know this right. is a regional orchestra right. and we're talking you know for for uh, just a regular player you know maybe at the most ten thousand right. dollars a year sure. and that's not enough to live on right uh it's good for supplementing i always tell my students you know don't quit your day job just because you get a, a you know job even if it's in an orchestra unless it's a full-time you know sure. major league situation um or if you, you supplement it with teaching or you got to do something else yeah and uh, but he loves the bass so much that he started he got his own server and he started the talk bass it was it was just like you were doing you yeah. know just a chat and it turns out that you know he has forms in there for uh, acoustic bass but a lot of it is electric bass yeah so you know, he just like you know you everybody has to have a sponsor it's just the same thing that we run at the ISB I mean a lot yeah. of the sponsors are what pays for this right as well as the membership and, and of course you know Paul had a membership so you know, I, I joined I think I'm a lifetime member uh, yeah, I was a gold that's, member that's, or something well he, he <laughs> hit upon on something that he was really started to really serve a need with that because I mean that's been such a popular uh, resource for bass players for, absolutely for you know like well over a decade maybe even almost two decades at this point it's really uh -huh. cool that and then you had this technological background and you're like working with him it's just kind of cool that he found a way to fuse those two interests after all going as a music major yeah. but then look what he created you know kind of serving both of those interests and that's what I I think that's what I benefit most from with the students is I always try to find what they are doing I had yeah. this one gal she was a pretty good player but I didn't realize it but she she was in the BA program which is not you know everybody will have to be in the, the BM program that's the Bachelor of Music in order to be a real you know musician or music student but you know she wanted to do the Bachelor of Arts and I always asked her, well, why do you want to do that? And she said, well, because she was going to be a doctor. And oh. she said that, do you know, hi, Jessica. Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Hi, hi. How, How are, are you? Doing? Yeah, yes. but, it's good, but it's okay. You're interrupting. <laughs> no, that's it's okay. okay. You're, you're you, never you, interrupting. We'll, we'll do it. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How nice are you? See you? Nice to see okay, you, too. Guys, I'm all right. All right. Nice to see you. Uh -huh. you having a good week? So far? Yeah, it's really? Amazing. I'm, yeah. I'm sure. Well, it's just... You know, hang out with a bunch of cool people who have to play your instrument. Well, right. we just had a that. really cool meeting for two hours. Yes, yeah. It went I heard on that. really well. Yeah, yeah it was, it was and really Jason cool. Jason got it all recorded. So, Well, thanks to David for asking, you know, like, yeah, like oh, yeah, to, to, to do it. Friendly, right? like, 
you know. Uh, and great lineup there, you know. Well, it's just like our conversation. I'm just saying, you know, everything you just have to be spontaneous and let it happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And don't, uh, you know, try to keep these barriers. Like, you know, everybody's they're so focused in their vision rather than just, you know, look around. It's right there. It's right in front of you. It's fun to see, like, all these people, you and then, like, Paul Ellison and Barry Green and Gary Carr, you know, and goofing around, you know, like, at a ta- with sure. all these. Yeah, it was it was it was pretty wild what's well, it is really one big family and and uh, we're all kind of interconnected mm-hmm. for sure no question and i mean it goes back before these guys i mean there was david walter mm-hmm. you know and he, mm-hmm. he, he, he always a good show oh yeah well he you know his book when he started out he wrote a book it was called the melodious bass Right. And it was the everybody's favorite playing series, that, and it's completely out of print now. But to this day, that book, I mean, he has little mini lessons and all the, he shows you like, you know, this is a, you know, beautiful dreamer, you know, <laughs> this yeah. hokey song. And then he would explain the musicality and why you would play this and how to be expressive. It wasn't just, well, you know, put your first finger here, put your second finger right. here and move the bow this way. You know, nothing, none of that. It was all about the musicality. Mm-hmm. And I think that as an early lesson is, you know, that really had an influence. So when David Walter, who is really good friends with you know Phyllis Young and I mm-hmm. had the privilege of having Phyllis there he came in and I had him as a clinician and uh, he would come in and it was just you know I remember taking my book and handing it to him and saying you know can you sign it and I, to this day I have that oh, book that's a with nice, his autograph that's on a nice it. Yeah. Keep. and uh, it's neat well I do that with all the guys you know and then we had Francois come in but anyway going back to Paul because that's uh, that's we're, talk- we're going to talk about Jessica too. But oh, she's all right, not be here. <laughs> <laughs> we got lots to talk about. Jessica. Okay, Paul had oh, come in and, and he was he started the talk that, yeah. base, and that was just uh, it was so he he worked on that. I remember he had problems with his server and all kinds of stuff. And, mm-hmm. Well, I have another student that uh, he's not here. His name's uh, George Folland, and he's like Jessica. They're both area teachers now in, in yeah. the Austin area. And, and Jessica's gone, you know, way. I mean, she does all these workshops now. Yeah. And, uh, but the stepping stone for all, by the way, for those workshops was uh, we did the Texas Bay Symposium. And that was kind of an offshoot. I didn't get into that when our other discussion uh, earlier with the, when we had the whole forum right. there. But, uh, we started doing that as a kind of a ref. We did it in between the uh, ISB events because they were every two years. Right. So what we did is the alternate years, the uh, even years instead of the odd years, we would do the uh, Texas Symposium. Mm-hmm. And that went on for many years. And we we'd do the same thing. We'd have a host university. And I think the last one we were going to do was at... Uh, at Houston University with Dennis Whitaker. Okay. And then Dennis, for whatever reason, he something happened. He with the opera because he was working the Grand Opera. He, Dennis is, does a million things. And anyway, it just it never happened. I mm-hmm. think there was somebody who was going to bring in. There were some problems getting in there, uh, so it just didn't happen. And then. Uh, then Lou said, hey, well, I can do it over here at Trinity University. And so he was teaching part-time down there. He was playing in the San Antonio Symphony at that time. And uh, so that's how that symposium got started. And then, then that evolved now that Lou's up in uh, at TCU. Now he does a biannual festival. Okay. And that's what and Gary was at that one. And that's what, you know, and, and Nick Walker had come in that one year. I mean... All this, it just sort of evolved. And again, it, it all began with the ISB. Oh, wow. So it, you it see all this. And, and this happened. And there are like repercussions. There are reflections of this all around the world. I mean, this happened in France. It happened in Germany. Uh, and all of these guys that were there, they were at those events mm-hmm. when they started. And I remember Mitt and Vald, that was the first one in Germany. But uh, the thing is, they wanted to have the ISP sponsor, but they couldn't oh. because, uh, you know, the ISP didn't have any money. So right. we, we, we can, you know, you can use our name or we're happy to, but we can't. 
do the event. Yeah. You're going to have to do it. You're yeah. going to have to host it. Well, they did it with uh, you know private monies, mm -hmm. and of course, then everybody and their brother was you know charging for room service, and they were you know where they brought their friends over, and I mean it was just it turned into a free for all, and of course they you know, they bellied up. Yeah, they couldn't keep it up. So. Uh, but it, but then they did the one in France. And that was another. But then some of those events, I think the the Prague has been more successful. They kind of learned from the yeah. past mistakes yeah. from the other conventions, mm -hmm. and so. But the tradition is carrying on, and uh, but those are really. I guess you can call it European ISB, but they're really more the European. Uh, Equivalent, I guess. Right, right. And, yeah, and I, I, I have to admit, I haven't gone to all of those. I, I would like to go to more, but I had some, I had some issues, some health issues that, that came up several years ago. I, I had uh, prostate cancer. Oh, okay. And I had a real extreme form of it, so I had to uh, kind of step back. Sure. That's one of the reasons sure. I retired early. I'm only, I, I'm just, uh, I'm 63 now. I'll be 64 in August. So just kind of getting, you know, most right. people with my age would be, still be working real hard. And right, teaching it. right. Yeah, but uh, I just took a hiatus for that. It was sure. just getting hard. Sure. But, uh, you know, I'm in better health now. Oh, but, good. Uh, That's good to hear. Yeah. 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 So that tradition of the even-numbered years has been going back for a while, whether Mittenwald or uh, or the, the, now the base year up and that yeah, sort of thing. That, that, those have usually been even years. And okay. you know, we started the – actually, uh, the, the ISB originally was all even years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it was – Austin was in 86, and L.A. was 88, and then New York – we didn't do 90, mm -hmm. even though it's printed in the bulletin that right. way. It's really, it was 91. Okay. Yeah, that's when New York happened. The In 90, that's when we had our board meeting. That's when we, we came together. That's when we got decided we need to get Madeline on board. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, that a lot of that didn't happen until after that. But Jeff put that whole thing together. Okay. He yeah. worked really hard on that. So he deserves all that credit. But it, again, it cost because he was hiring people. You know, I mean, Ron Carter, he wasn't going to do this stuff for free. Sure, sure. And uh, though I think later he, he did. He does volunteer. Yeah. But at the time, it was really hard for us. But we also had Bill Hinton, and we had, you know, greater the greats. And those guys, you know, always carried forward. They are always giving back. Very generous. So it was through their kindness and support. Well, oh, by the way, I wanted to mention this. The reason we got John Clayton in as president in 91. See, John, we needed a figurehead. Mm -hmm. And John was not about to organize a convention. But I would, uh -huh. even though I had already done it. And so I said, look, why don't we have John, because he's a big yeah, right. notoriety, right. let's make him the president. And mm -hmm. the president doesn't have to do anything. Yeah. It's the president-elect. They're the ones that have to organize okay, the next convention. Okay, there we go. <laughs> That's how it worked out. That's why when they had the next convention every two years in 93 at Interlochen, I was the one who put that together with Madeline. That okay. was Madeline's first okay. convention. That was the first time we put something together. And uh, and then we, of course, since that with Larry was there, then we made Larry the president. Uh, and so Larry, instead of doing interlocking, which I did, then Larry did 95. <laughs> it's kind of funny how that works out. It, it, it yeah. But, and but, you, but you that, put together right. so many of these. Still, if you were involved with the interlocking one, and then the Austin, and, and then the like organized with the 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 other, you know, the alternating year events. Uh, yeah, the, we had throughout. the Texas Symposium, yeah. and I don't know if you have a record of that, but that was basically all in Texas. Yeah. Uh, although we would invite people from all the, the surrounding states, we get a lot of people in. But that was kind of cool. And uh, yeah, and, and, and Ron Chong Lu is now carrying that tradition on mm -hmm. TCU. Um, but the other, uh, you know, there's just so much to talk about. Well, it's interesting. So, like, like when did you, because you were at, you were at Amherst before. Yeah. UT Austin, right? Is that That's the progression? Yeah. When, when did you when did you come to Texas from there? Okay, first I was at <laughs> University of Massachusetts at Amherst, mm -hmm. and that was in the year of 1975 okay. to 1978. 
And uh, yeah, I need to tell you the story about that. Yeah, well, let's go through my bio. <laughs> and then we'll all start tying together. Um, yeah, can we kind of step back? We mm -hmm. were going backwards or forwards. Absolutely. All right. We want to rewind to Monterey. Okay, well, actually, okay, I grew up. <laughs> I grew up in uh, in Pebble Beach, California. Pebble Beach, California, yeah. which is right there in Monterey, and uh, I started bass when I it was in the fourth grade, mm -hmm. and I remember going in and my one of my best friends, Bart, played uh, he played the cello, and I thought that was really cool. I want to play the cello, so I went in to the classroom. And uh, I, there, there was a Mrs. Brady. She was the music teacher, orchestra teacher. And I said, "Hey, I want to, I want to, you know, can I play cello? I want to, because my my friend Bart plays it." She goes, "Well, you know, we're all out of cellos, but over there in the corner, we have something that's just like it. It's a little bigger. It's called the bass. Why don't you check it out?" So she wrote me into doing the bass. Well, of course, the minute I played it. You know, I, I even took it home on the bus, and uh, then you're addicted. You're hooked, and I, I just stuck, stuck with the bass. I was the only one in the area that played bass. Everything we did was bass, bass, bass. Um, and then I was fortunate enough, uh, a couple years later, I, uh, I was in uh, junior high school. This 1967, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this bass player came to our junior high school, and it was Gary Carr. Oh, wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, I, I had no idea who this guy was. All I heard was that somebody said, well, this really great guy is playing the bass. It's a solo. I said, what? Yeah. And so I went and saw him. And uh, I remember looking up at his bass. And he says, he, you know, he kind of he remembers that I, yeah. I went there. Yeah. And uh, I never forgot that. And then I think all through high school, yeah, I, I continued to play bass. And then I uh, started getting serious and taking some lessons. Well, it turned out where I grew up, they had this, uh, it was called Lyceum of Monterey. And it was a uh, summer festival that was taught by a conductor, Richard Laird, from uh, Los Angeles. And it was a conductor's workshop. Oh, okay. And he would hire an orchestra from all the uh, uh, orchestra players from around the state, you know, that use the you know top positions, so really fine players. And it was a conductor's workshop, training workshop. Mm -hmm. Well, associated with that, they had this lyceum where they had students that would audition. And of course, I was the only bass player, <laughs> but I got to study with the professional musicians, orchestra people. And uh, I was, you know, I had, I think the, one of the first etude books I was given was. Uh, the story Trabe, 57 oh, studies. And wow. I mean, can you imagine that being in, uh, I was like, you know, middle school and getting this, this kind of training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was really fortunate. Um, then I, st I, you know, continued with it. And then that went for a couple summers. And then they had this, uh, the Bach Festival in Monterey. Mm -hmm. And then I think I worked with them a little bit, uh, again, as a student. Right. And then, uh, then I went to, study at San Jose State University and there was a, a bass teacher there named Bob Manning, Robert Manning. And he had a bunch of these uh, pieces that were all written out uh, on kind of onion skin paper and it was written, uh, some of the pieces were written by this gentleman named Herman Reinshagen. Oh, here we go. And okay. that was, and it turned out that Bob Manning had studied with Gary and uh, I guess from Ryan's I get into Los Angeles. So this is all in California. So we were in Northern California, this was in Southern California. When I auditioned at that this Lyceum, I remember one of the uh, the people said, "Hey, you, this is this kid's really promising. He's kind of like that that guy that we you know heard about yeah. in Los Angeles." And I, I didn't know who they were talking about. They never mentioned names, but uh, but they were talking about Gary Carr. Wow. Turns out, after when I went to San Jose, and I found this out later, uh, one of the other one of my alumnus when I when I finally went to San Jose State was uh, Barry Green. Oh, he had really? Gone, wow, he small had gone world. To, <laughs> and I didn't know this until after I met Barry later in the seventies. Uh, so it was really it was very interesting. Um, I got my first gig uh, with the San Jose Symphony. I went to school, I was a transfer 
from a junior college in Monterey. Oh, by the way, I, when I started college, uh, I didn't know what to do. This is, now you gotta understand, this is, uh, at the, we had the Vietnam War going on. This is 1970, 1969, 1970. And uh, you know, people were being drafted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember, uh, my father was in the military. He was a colonel, brigade commander, so I was kind of an army brat. So I, you know, I didn't have any problems with the you know, military. Right. Really. But I certainly didn't want to go to Vietnam because that, that was not a pretty sight. Sure. So there was it was pretty radical, and especially in California. It was a very very liberal uh, state. I, I can imagine. Yeah. What it and, was like uh, at the time. I mean, you have UC Berkeley. Right, you know, right. you know about that. And it, I was cool. So I kind of grew up on both sides of the fence, mm -hmm. just like bass players. You know, we get German and French. But well, I was on. I I saw both sides of everything, and. Uh, so I had a lot of choices. So I was going into, my major was gonna be electrical engineering. That's what I started out. I did one semester, uh, I got through the math class and I thought, you know, this is, I, I, I just wasn't into it. Right, right. And then I, I remember I had a friend, it was a girlfriend who mentioned, she said, well, you just need to follow your heart. It was kind of a, you know, very, you know, kind of a hippie movement type of thing. Yeah, 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 you know? right, right. right. <laughs> well, follow your heart, you know, go for love. Okay, whatever. Well, I like playing music, so I'll just you know, stick with my bass. And so I, I changed majors. I went to bass. And then I started taking some lessons with Bob Manning. And then I transferred up to uh, San Jose. I got to San Jose, and they, they had an audition. Uh, my, by the way, my teacher was also happened to be the orchestra conductor, oh, okay. <laughs> as well as the bass teacher. <laughs> so he said, well, they're having this uh, audition for the local symphony, San Jose, which was a regional orchestra. I didn't know anything about it. Right. So I went to the audition, and I was armed with, uh, I brought my Smandel studies with that Stuart Sankey had, uh, it was his edition. And in the first part of that edition, when I was at the audition, I was, I, you know, I, he said, well, go ahead and play something. So I think I played an etude or something. And then he goes, well, do you know, have any orchestra music? And I said, well, I got this you know, piece, it's in the front of the Smandel book, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the Wretched Active. And he goes, great, that sounds good. Why don't you play that? Now, you got to understand, this is before they had committees. Mm -hmm, sure. This is yeah. where you just met the conductor. And uh, I think the guy, he had flamey white hair. So I think it might have been Carmen Dragon or somebody. Okay. Some, yeah. Somebody. And uh, so I played for him. And then after the, and then I played the, the Beethoven and he goes, great, see you Tuesday night. Oh, and so I walk wow. out and here's a couple <laughs> other people. They hadn't even gone in there. Really, I didn't know who they were, oh, no. but they were students apparently. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> so I, I didn't think anything of it. You know, I, I figured, well, that was, that was cool. So I get to the uh, symphony at, at, uh, at the university. We had our for rehearsal and there was this other gal there and she was, in, uh, she was senior. I was just transfer. Uh, I think yeah. I was a sophomore. And she goes, "Oh, so you're David Newbert, huh? Did you do that audition? You know, you took that was my job. Oh, I was no. supposed to." Go. And she, <laughs> she, and I said, "Hey, look, you know, I don't know what's going on here. It was so funny, but uh, you know, it was. And then there was another kid. Uh, his name was Pat Kennedy." And to this day, and then Patrick, he, he, he played with the symphony too. But uh, we became real good friends, and I still stayed in touch with him. How cool. After all these years. But uh, yeah, he's still out in San Jose. Um, so that's what, that happened in San Jose. Then at the end of my, oh, while I was there, the reason I got into it, I got back into electronic music because there was a, a teacher there. His name was Alan Strange. Well, Alan Strange is like, you know, you've heard of uh, Don Buchla? Yeah, right. I've heard the of Don Buchla. Buchla synthesizer? Yeah. Uh-huh, right. Well, remember, this is the 60s. This is the 70s, early 70s. Well, Don Buchla had made this, his one of his first synthesizers. It was a bright red box, just like the, it wasn't the Moog, but Alan Strange was a good friend of his. He was a composer, and he had one of these in his downstairs. I was like, I came into the building one day, and I heard it was like, it was a beautiful sunny day, like today. And, but I heard this, it was like rain. So I was like, where is this rain coming from? And I walked by the studio, and he had the, the they were doing the pink noise. Oh, right? yeah, right. And they were recreating these sounds. I said, what? That was really cool. So I wanted to check that out. So I, I started learning about 
and I worked with Alan Strange and I learned about electronic music. Oh, what a great place to learn about that. I mean, as Shinji Ishima, another Bay Area Bay, plays in the San Francisco uh -huh. Opera and Ballet, you know, composer. And he was, um, he was telling me just about what it was like growing up there. You know, he went to Stanford and just like that experimental kind of progressive atmosphere. Yeah. In Stanford, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I played a concert at Stanford with uh, George Ligeti. Oh yeah, right, that. right. We did Atmospheres, and that was it. That was uh, unbelievable. And uh, I think then the, my first experience with with the jazz, they had uh, they were uh, they were the jazz ensemble at the school was doing a con they were doing a, a, a contest up in uh, Ber at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have a bass player, so they said, "Hey, you play bass. Could you come up and do this?" And you, all you got to do is read this chart, just you know, root fifth, and you, you yeah, got it. Yeah. Okay, whatever. <laughs> so I went and did. I was fearless. I, I did stuff I didn't even know about. So I went and did that. So I, I learned how to you know, kind of read charts. Yeah. And uh, then when I graduated. Uh, well, anyway, so I had the electronic music on. I was kind of doing everything. I was learning. I learned. I got my flying lessons when I was. That's when you started yeah. doing that. Okay. I took. I did ground school, and then it was when I got out of it. I uh, I joined the Navy Flying Club, which is in Monterey, and I actually got flying lessons. But I all did it all that one summer, and then uh, uh, that was after I went to San Jose. But uh, yeah, there were a lot of things going on then. So I learned a little jazz, I learned that. My first, uh, then I did a summer workshop in, uh, in, in Hawaii. Mm. And uh, this is when I had applied, because I, I wanted to stay in school. By this time, they had stopped the, the selective service. They, the year they ended, it was 1972. So I was, I was off the hook. I didn't have to worry about okay. that. But I stayed in school anyway. And there goes, there's Hans. That's another. Hi, Hans. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then, after the after then that summer, I went to uh, I went to uh, Hawaii. Okay. And they had an orchestra workshop there, an orchestra ensemble, and Frederick Blotz taught it. And they had a guest artist, and his name was Joseph Gingold. Oh, okay. And so uh, Joe Gingold, well, my girlfriend was a violinist, and she's the one that talked to me. Going, I, I basically I just kind of go where people suggest. Sure. In fact, when I got so I went there and I got to work with Joe Gingold. He showed me all the other kids were having lessons on uh, on uh, uh, violin, mm -hmm. and uh, I asked him, "Can I do a master class? You know, on the bass?" He goes, "Oh, okay." He was just like a little kid. He so, yeah, yeah, whatever. So I played the Kuzovitsky, and to this day, I use the same. He showed me some of the Boeing's. You know, oh, suggestions. cool! I've been using those, and I noticed a lot of the kids are playing the same exact. Now it may be a common thing that teachers, but it's not printed. Those Boeing's are not printed mm -hmm. in the part, and uh, so I got a lot of ideas from him. Uh, yeah, it's funny how it, how, it, how it, a, a master player on another instrument can like even like bring a different perspective to like a bass piece. Absolutely. Like, I remember uh, the the principal cellist in the Lyric Opera, a colleague of mine. He played the third page of Kusevitsky for him, and he said, well, "Why don't you go it this way?" And it was like starting up bow and all this stuff, and it sounded it sounded great. And it was just like one of those things like we learn it a certain way, and we just have it ingrained in us so much that sometimes mm -hmm. like a totally outsider perspective can like exactly. Yeah. But I knew he was a master teacher when he would coach a, a string quartet and he would talk to the, uh, the cellist, he said, and he would play, like the viol he'd play all the different parts on his instrument without even looking at the music. Oh, yeah, that's a... And he could, he could simply, oh, that phrase goes like this, man. Or someone would play unaccompanied Bach, and he would just accompany. He would harmonize while they were playing to keep them you know, motivated, yeah. shaping the line. And I, you know, I, I was young enough, I didn't understand that, but I right. can tell that's what makes a great teacher. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. someone that you know mm -hmm. totally listens, and they approach the instrument. It's like they've never heard it before. So when you play something for them, even if it's terrible, it's good. Uh, even if it's terrible, the uh, they'll find something great to say right. about it. Right. And I, and, uh, I, and what was it? There was a famous story of I guess Pablo Casals was uh, he had heard someone play. 
and uh, it was really, really just terrible. It was all out of tune. And then he stopped and he said, when they finished, he goes, you know that, that F sharp you played that one note? The vibrato was just so beautiful. Mm. How you did mm -hmm. that, you know? And he just focused on the positive, didn't that. focus yeah. on the negative, and just to keep them inspired. And I think that's really, really important that teachers learn how to do that. That's yeah. powerful, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can you can criticize and be negative all day long, but that's not going to help you move forward. Right. So, anyway, after uh, <laughs> let's see, we're, we're, we we okay. I went to San Jose. And I did that jazz gig. Then I went to Eastman. Okay. And I went there. Uh, another guy who was a friend of mine uh, happened to uh, let's see. I, I wanted to go to grad school, so I sent a tape. I didn't go there because it was too far to go. So I sent Oscar a tape. I had played the uh, there was they had a broke chamber ensemble at San Jose State, and we played. I got to play the Dittersdorf bass concerto oh, with an great. ensemble. Yeah. And, that, and so I took the ta real real tape of that recorded that concert. I sent that in. That was my audition. <laughs> and they just wrote back saying, great, you know, we'll give you a full scholarship. Ah, nice. Come on. <laughs> so I went there and I get my master's. Well, the first semester I, I got there, I took a course in electronic music with the uh, I forgot his name. But anyway, this is old school. He's a very famous composition teacher. And uh, I can't remember who it was. But anyway, I did a piece. I took uh, the Havana's Song of Wales, oh, which yeah, I right. had listened to in my classes. And I thought, hey, I could duplicate these sounds on the bass. So I, I made a music concrete piece where I had, I, we call it a tape piece. So I had recordings of the whales. And then I had sounds with this, the, and I used the waves, the sounds that you create for waves with the sine tone generators mm -hmm. to create the illusion of uh, sound. And I created my first electronic piece, and that was called Moby Bass. And then later, I'll, I'll tell you how I put it all together, I actually made a, re a recording with some other electronic pieces, which I did later in 1980 when I was at Dartmouth College. But anyway, that was my first piece. That first semester, uh, when I got there, they did. They just stuck me as they made me principal of the school orchestra. And I'm like, hey, not, what are you guys doing? You know. <laughs> So I learned real quick how to be a, a principal in an orchestra. As one of the classes, they had a workshop on how to write a resume. Oh. So I took this, I took the class and I, I you know, filled everything out. And one of the things in the resume, it said, where would you least like to live? And it was, uh, I said, I'll, I either coast, west coast, east coast, but I'll absolutely, the worst place I'd ever want to live is in the middle of the country. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like Kansas, something like right, that. Right. You know? And so they said, okay. So I was at, uh, I was by the mailboxes, it was Christmas break, right before Christmas break, and Oscar handed me this, Oscar Zimmerman was there, and he opened his mailbox and he said, hey, here's this opening at uh, the University of Massachusetts, why don't you check it out? And he just handed him and said, hey, this is great, I can, I can submit my resume that I've been practicing writing, how to write one. So I sent it out, I didn't think of anything of it, I went home, back home to California, and I get a phone call saying, you're one of the three finalists. <laughs> oh, so, wow. Again, it was all you know, kind of fate. You yeah, know, it just, sure. It just sort of happened. I, it was never my intention to do that. But, so I thought, well, okay, well, just go for it. I still was in school. I only had one semester. I hadn't <laughs> finished. And this is probably one of the craziest things I've ever done. So I ended up going back. I did the audition. And uh, one of the pieces I played, it was really interesting because when I got there, there was a guy leaving. I didn't know who it was. And then I did my, I did my interview. And uh, I played this piece. It was by Max Stern. Sonnet and Dance from the Ten Souls for Bass that Oscar yeah, had just written. Right. And uh, so I got, I, I played that. And then after I finished, then they said, well, can you do a jazz piece? And I said, sure, you know, let's do Satin Dog. I had learned that from playing in a club the summer before. And uh, 
that's a whole other story. We won't go there. <laughs> so I played this. Uh, I played the uh, thing, and I and they ended up calling me back. And, but they were kind of snickering because they said, "Well, you know that guy that you that left right before you came in. That was Max Stern. So oh, you played his piece, really." And I, oh. I was like, "Well, how come he didn't get the job?" We said, "Well, you were a better player, but he was a, he's obviously a better composer." So uh, we all, but we were, you know, bass players are always it's cool. Right. It turned out when I went to UMass Amherst, the reason. And I got that position was I was replacing another bass player that was leaving, and his name was Reggie Workman. Oh wow, Reggie, Reggie Workman. Workman! I mean, wow. and and the other guys that were on the faculty, and I didn't know all this was uh, there was a drummer named Max Roach, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and then they had this other they had a, a saxophone player. His name was Archie Shep. So here I am. I'm I, in this situation. I'm and I'm only like I'm 22 years old. I'm, I'm really I was very precocious. And uh, not, not knowing anything, I hadn't taught before. I didn't know anything right. about teaching. Right. So uh, I'm still going to school. I'm, I haven't finished my master's yet. <laughs> so I had to go back and forth. Well, I didn't have a car, so I just took a bus. Well, I, the buses were like nine hours long. Uh, so I ended up buying this car. It was a 1966 Volvo 122 S. I ever remember the car. And... Uh, I drove, so I started driving my car. So I stayed at one place. I was staying at some lady's house, and she was a secretary there. And then I'd go back, and I'd stay with another friend in my house. Um, at his place, when I was going to school, I actually finished my degree. I don't know how I did it. But uh, it was I think it was easier to get a degree back in those days. Um, but uh, anyway, I finished up there, and suddenly I had a couple of these students that were kind of from Reggie's studio. Yeah. And uh, there, I think there were four of them. One of them was, uh, well, David Gage was mm -hmm. one of my students. Avery Sharp mm -hmm. was one of the students. Uh, Mark Abrams. And uh, it was Joel Majinski. I think he was the other one. I didn't have very many. There was just a few. So I told him, you know, taught him what I could. Meanwhile, my base had to be worked on. And uh, David Gage said, hey, I, I, I knew Charles Traeger down in New York. And I said, well, he said, well, I'll, I'll show you, I, I'll drive you down there. So he drove me down there. Well, he became in, in, totally into uh, repair, doing base repair. And, you know, me being the mentor, you know, I said, hey, well, maybe you ought to check that out. And so he did. And he went back and he became his apprentice and the rest is history. Now we have David Gage. Yeah. And, uh, and he, David was always, he's been, oh, he's older than I am. He was like six years older. Uh, it was uh, just ironic how things, you know, work. Again, it's, yeah, all, no kidding. it's all fate. Yeah. You know, it just sort of happens. Yeah. Um, let's see. I played uh, with the, San, uh, the Springfield Symphony. I was the principal. First, Max Stern was the principal. Then he left and then I, I moved up. I became principal. Uh, when I was there, this is kind of off the, off the topic, but then we had a, a guest cellist came up. He was a student at uh, Juilliard. He studied with Leonard Rose. And I didn't know this, but uh, his name was Yo-Yo Ma. Hey. We had lunch <laughs> together <laughs> with oh, some great. other guys. And uh, they all knew who Yo-Yo, he was this great cellist. But, you know, I was just, oh, you go along for the ride. And to this day, uh, Yo-Yo remembers that meeting. And, and whenever I play a concert with him, you know, I'll, he'll come up and he'll remember me. Yeah. It's kind of wow. cool. He's a, he's a super, super human being. Yeah. You know, I find that with all these people, like Willie Nelson, all these people, they're just so gregarious, and mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're the most uh, caring human beings you'll ever meet. You know, no pretension. Yeah. What's same with Francois Robot? You know, you meet these. The, these are the superstars of our, but they're just people like you're totally else. approachable. Yeah, I think that it's that spirit that we're carrying on. That's why people want to give back. It's because you meet people like that. Yeah. Ray Brown was the same way. Yeah. Always just give, give, give. And uh, just amazing. But anyway, so after, uh, then after that, then I went to, I was there for three years until 1978. And then uh, a job opened up in Wichita, Kansas. Oh no, where you didn't want to go. <laughs> and so I ended up, I ended up, uh, I applied and I went out for the audition and uh, got the job. And at that time, basically, you would do your your interview and audition for the symphony and 
the orchestra at the same time. So they had, so after I did my interview at the university, then I went over to uh, the local symphony and I did a, a separate audition for the conductor. So it wasn't like, you know, this is a pre-union stuff. So again, you, you literally, the old school, the way that you would do it is the professor or the teacher and, or the principal of mm -hmm. the section would just, you know, tell the conductor say hey well, we need another player oh just a minute and he'd call and tell a student well come on in and then they would play at the gig there would be no audition or they would just you know do something for the conductor and they'd say fine yeah that was yeah. a completely different Times story have yeah, yeah. Have changed. if you could play a major scale in tune they would probably you know you'd probably get hired or as as uh, uh who wrote uh What's that song that uh, I'm trying to think of her name? Emily Cates. Emily Cates wrote the, the day the bass players took over the world. Oh, yeah. Well, Emily is from Austin. <laughs> oh, really? And, <laughs> and her boyfriend at the time was a harmonica player who wanted to, he wanted to learn to play bass. So I, that's how oh, I cool. learned to get, hook up with Emily. But... Uh, yeah, that's kind of funny that <laughs> when I start talking about something, I, I these are memories. Yeah, other sure. memories. It's like the wheels of the wheels. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm in Wichita. I was there for uh, three years or f six years, and then uh, I I need. They said, well, you have to have a terminal degree in order to you know go up for your promotion. And uh, I thought, okay, uh, I'll just go, you know, I'll go back to school at the Eastman. So I went to did a summer program in, uh, I guess it was 19, it would have been, say so I was, it would have been 80, 1982, 83, right okay. around there. Um, I met James Vandemar. That's when I met him. And he had just gotten the job uh, earlier. Sure. Yeah, he had won the uh, competition, I guess, at uh, Buffalo Philharmonic, mm -hmm. and uh, but he was, you know, carrying on an Oscars tradition. Uh, but I think JB was he, he was actually a Gary Carr student. Yeah, he said he, he was he, Gary, he, and yeah. so he was a German yeah. bow player. See, Oscar was a French bow player, and I, I was uh, when I told you, you know, he had the Reins Hagen School and in Juilliard, the Terrell L. and the Terrell yeah. School out of Curtis. Uh, that's a, a whole other topic of discussion. But uh, you'll read about that when we'll, we'll put an article yeah. together. But uh, anyway, going back to, so I did JB that summer. Uh, I took a really cool course uh, on Wagner. Oh, Wagner, Wagner and okay. operas from Robert Bailey. And he, those are the days when you could smoke anywhere. I mean, you know, airplanes, people would smoke. This guy, he was a change. He would sit there in the back of the class. You wear a bow tie and he'd smoke a cigarette. And he would just talk off the top of his head. He had these graduate seminars for like two or three hours. And he just talked. And then I thought, well, how can this guy do that? Well, if you go to the, the, the uh, what was that, the dictionary for musicians, the Wagner. Oh, the... Oh yeah, yeah. It's the name. I can't remember the name right now. I know what you're okay. talking about. Though. Well, yeah. anyway, it's the, the the Groves Dictionary or whatever. Mm -hmm. He wrote the articles. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he was the guy that wrote. And he was an expert. Everybody like the Met did an opera. They'd go to him because he knew all. He knew all the details. It was really cool. So I was really lucky. I don't know why I brought that up because that really doesn't have anything to do with anything. <laughs> I did do one opera by Wagner. But anyway. So then, that then after that, I decided. Well, let's see, it wouldn't, didn't work out. I ended up. Uh, I said, well, the best place for me to go to school that wouldn't cost very much. I could study with Stuart Sankey. I could go down to Austin. So I applied to Austin to go study with Stuart Sankey. Well, I get there. Stuart Sankey had just left. Oh, they didn't tell me anything about it. Was that when he went to Michigan? He or went to that? Indiana first. Or Indiana first. First, first Michigan. Indiana, okay, okay. and then he went to Michigan. So uh, I ended up, uh, I studied with Mark Burnett. Okay. And, and Mark was, you know, he, he was a Gary Carr student. Mm -hmm. So and now, now I'm, you know, I had switched ba before this. I did go through the thing. I talked about a little bit about it right. at the summer workshop with Gary. Uh, that's when I had switched to German bow. So from that point on, I was pretty much playing German bow. Although, I, you know, I still could play French sure. bow, and I still do to this day. But uh, I mainly did German. Then, uh, uh, so where are we at now? We're 
Yeah, we in Wichita. Just making it to just uh, St- Sankey heading down to Austin. Austin. Okay, so that yeah. was in 1981. Yeah. 1981, I did my and I I went down there to finish my degree, my doctorate mm-hmm. degree, and uh, I all I needed wanted to do is say I didn't want to take a, a did I take a year I think I took a year off, and I I did I finished the doctorate. I had the fastest degree in the west <laughs> i finished the doctorate in one year oh that's uh that's, that's unheard of yeah and the, well the reason i could do it there was two this is how i worked it out first of all um i already had a couple of these courses so i had some academic courses i could transfer from eastman which were doctor sure. level and the second of all uh at that time well, and then also, I, I was already, a, I could play solos, so I didn't have any problem with the, the you have to do three solo styles, no problem. I, you know, I could do those in my sleep. Uh, then the, but the th- other thing is that they have different degree requirements today that they did back then. And one of the requirements, that you had to have a foreign language. Well, remember I was telling you about Anton Torello? Yeah. He was from Spain. So I convinced the committee <laughs> that Spanish should be considered uh, the equivalent of a foreign language for my degree area. In other words, I didn't have to do French or German, which I, I couldn't have done. I would have had taken those courses yeah. and taken at least two years. Well, I had two years of Spanish already. Oh, there you go. So all I had to do is translate an article. So boom, I, I knocked that. That was a big yeah, that's a hurdle for a lot, lot of time. people. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I took all these shortcuts. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Oh. And uh, anyway, and then that summer, I, uh, I literally locked myself in a room at the library. They had these cubicles. And I spent three weeks and I worked on, and I wrote my uh, treatise, which is on contemporary and accompanied double bass works for double bass. And it was based on uh, performance styles and notation. For the instruments, and I used, you know, of course, Bert Turetsky, who I right. met when I was out in California, and uh, I knew of his book, Contemporary uh, Bass Playing, and that's the, you know, that compendium of resources. Absolutely. But what it doesn't talk about is doesn't talk about how do those notations in these devices he perform how does it apply to the music mm. so uh, my analysis was of the music and how it pertained to the so it wasn't just about an exploration of techniques right. but it was and then I tied it all together with the notation so I did a kind of a history of notation as the pieces developed from 1960 you know like the George Pearl Monody mm-hmm. mm-hmm. 2 which by the way George Pearl was my supervisor's teacher, uh, Elliot Anticolitz. And so his specialty was uh, w- what they call, uh, well, they're the Z cells, but it's 20th century music writing. It, it, it's a long story. But anyway, this is my, my interest in contemporary music because I'm kind of a contemporary music yeah, guy. sure. And also then I had this electronic stuff. So that's why... I, coming to the convention you say I ran into Robert Black mm-hmm. and Mark Dresser these guys were all in the same wavelength yeah. with the new music stuff so I'm kind of into that too uh, but meanwhile I was also playing the orchestra so and I'm doing the pedagogy uh, when I got when I did get the job when I after I got my degree um, I met uh, Phyllis Young okay right and she she kind of helped me too with my my playing and everything when I graduated from there I went back to uh, Wichita and then uh, about a year later I get a phone call and they said well this base we were, our base user is leaving could you come down and I said well what about the interview well we've already heard you just come on down oh, that's, that's so I went down yeah. and but the, at this time now the, you know I you have to be a, uh, I was in the union in uh, the, the musicians union when I was in Wichita because it was required but in Texas, it's a right to work state. You don't have to be a union member. Well, I kept my union membership. Mm-hmm. Anyway, they had the Santa, the Austin Symphony re- had. They have a requirement that you have to play an audition. Mm-hmm. So even though there was an opening for the principal, I had to audition. Well, turned out I was the only one that did the audition. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was kind of <laughs> ridiculous. But the conductor, uh, it, was, it was I think it was Sun Kwok, uh, asked me to play this. Uh, it was a portion I know you do a bunch of stuff on auditions 
and I had to play the storm scene, mm -hmm. the storm scene sure. from the pastor out. And which is ridiculous because it's really a, more of an effect than yes. anything else. And uh, so I said, okay, I'll do it. So I played it. And he, you could hear him sitting over there kind of snickering, like, ha, 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 you can't do that. And I, you know, I, but I realized, you know, this is all effect anyway. So I, I had the job. It, it was, I had to go through the Just a stipulation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it was kind of funny. And then they had the committee, of course, they had to vote. But uh, after that, yeah, they, they're, they're pretty good about, they do always do start with the blind auditions so that you know it's totally fair yeah but uh, anyway so then uh, then I was in and I started teaching there and uh, then I uh, some of my colleagues of course uh, Elliot, uh, Phyllis Young she mm -hmm. was a major part of my uh, work especially with the Asta and the yeah. teaching oh. you know she wrote the string game uh, playing the string game that's a book oh, yeah. that I would use at DePaul and when I was teaching I would that was a book I would have my pedagogy students use because I just thought it was so brilliant the way that she taught all these all these exercises uh, and these fundamental motions and yeah. there's so much you could transfer over from cello to bass from that so what I learned from that is uh uh, teaching with analogies. I wrote mm -hmm. this article, and remember, I told you I, I was I became asked a base form editor. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I did, of course, was this interview with Gary Carr. You got to look this up. Yeah, I've got to look. This is a very historical. Well, I stuff. remember. I remember looking at our. You when did you do that? That when were you doing that column? It was for a while. That right? was. I think it was only for two or two or maybe two or four years. But I know. I think uh, Patrick Nair uh, picked it up. David Walter did it before me. Okay. I think okay. it was around 1988, 89, okay. 90. Those two years. So there would have been like uh, three or four columns that I did. And uh, some of it was, you know, my own stuff. I wrote the, this article of uh, teaching with analogies. Mm -hmm. And I used the idea, and a lot of these ideas I got from Phyllis. But uh, one of the, in that article on teaching with analogies, there was another one I wrote. It was called... Uh, Golden uh, talent, the golden key to success. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's the one. Remember, I met you know Jessica was in here before. I use Jessica as an example of someone who, where you they can do something without you even telling them how to do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Jessica was really good at mimicking stuff. And okay. She was in high school at the time. By the way, she was our babysitter for our kids. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. Yeah. When I got to Austin, uh, my first son Joshua was born. And, uh, and then BJ, our second set, came on uh, in 86. And that's when we did the convention. So here I had, you know, all these kids doing the symphony, doing the teaching. We need, you need babysitters. When you got little kids, you uh, need yeah. babysitters big time. And uh, Terry, my wife, had quit her job. She wasn't working. She was just, you know, supporting me full time. So uh, Jessica was our babysitter because <laughs> she lived right down the street. So I, I got Jessica going. Uh, she got her first bass. I had a, a bass that she bought, I think, for next to nothing. Mm -hmm. And then I remember she took it to New York and had it appraised. David Gage says, you know what your, that bass is worth? That you, you know? And I said, yeah, well, yeah, she's my student. Yeah. And uh, she made her career from having that, a good instrument. Wow. So you know, great way to you know, move it forward. Um, but anyway, in this article I wrote on the gold, the talent, the gold key to success, uh, I used Jessica as an example. I said, well, here I had this student, and I don't think I mentioned her by name. I might have. Um, and I was talking, I would play the, the Dragon Eddie, you know, where you do the, the thumb position. Mm -hmm. I had never told her how to do thumb position. And I went, da, 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 you know, the beginning, how it opens up. By the way, the Dragonetti Concerto, I hate to tell people this, but it wasn't written by Domenico Dragonetti. It was Edward Nanny. Right, right. So George Vance was correct when he said this is a tri attributed Dragonetti, Dragonetti, but it's really Lots. Nanny. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know. But anyway, so she used that as an example. And uh, she, so I used her, and then she played it right after I played it. And I said, you, how can you do that? I haven't even taught you how to play thumb position yet. Well, I can just see... That's talent. That's yeah. what I define as talent. Someone that can, they intuitively figure it out. Mm -hmm. That's talent. Um, or having a good ear. I mean, there's lots of ways you can have yeah. talent. But I think, or the other thing I do with little kids, if I get a little kid, I don't care what they play or what they do, if, I can, if they can sing back a phrase, 
that's a talent. That kid, he can hear mm-hmm. the pitch. They can match it. Boom. And I think back when I very first started uh, with Mrs. Brady, one of the first things she did, she said, okay, she played it on the piano. She had me sing it. I could I could hit the, sing the pitch back. I didn't even think anything about it. But she said, that's not, you know, very common. Kids can't do that. So it's a good, that's it's, another way to yeah. so indicator. Uh, work your ear learn and I think when I went to when I was in undergrad the thing I really concentrated on because I didn't have a lot of that was ear training mm-hmm. and you have to train your ear and just sing everything you can count everything you can we're in Benfield when I did the audition in Chicago he uh, well, he pointed out all the people that came out He, by the way Warren Benfield had more students in that survey I did he had over 600 students oh it's unbelievable yeah across the world yeah. but he said the one the biggest mistake that all the people he said 90% of your auditions the reason you don't get into the finals is of one thing can't count you're mm-hmm. not County. If people would just count or be aware of the rhythm, they would, you know, they'd probably sail through. Mm-hmm. And so it's so important. I, I, this uh, class I saw the other day with uh, Ira Gold. Yeah. He, you know, he was doing the Beethoven Seventh, and they were just, you know, counting, counting, counting. They did every single beat, every combination, and really, that's what it's about. It's, it's so important that rhythm. Uh, we do say. Oh, by the way, Ira. I think I'm related to everybody. <laughs> Ira. His father, when I was in, in Massachusetts in Northampton, he was I I would he did also did bass work. He's the one that suggested right. I would on New York see Charles Trigger, but he was his father was a, a, a repair luthier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, he was one of the few that would actually did basses. He would work on basses, and most of them, you know, hey, they wouldn't touch a bass with right. a ten foot pole. Right. So that was rare to find someone. But that was in then uh, Ira Gold came. Isn't that great? I, yeah. Isn't it funny how they all comes back around? It's a small world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember Ira telling me that. I used to play with Ira in a chamber orchestra in Memphis, Tennessee, before he got the National really? Symphony job. Yeah. Okay. I remember listening to him play his excerpts. This is like way back. And I'm thinking, like, well, that's, that's how it's done, you know? Okay, I got to tell you those other two stories about yeah, how, I, how I ran into. Uh, okay. I was at, when I was teaching in Massachusetts. Remember that I was? They had the Performing Arts Center right next to it. And uh, anyway, the Chicago Symphony came in, and they were on tour. And uh, there was this guy practicing down in the basement. And I, and I went down. And I introduced myself. Said I'm, I teach bass here. He was a younger guy. And uh, he said, "Yeah." You know, I said, "What are you working?" I said, "Well, I got this audition coming up tomorrow." And. Uh, it turns out it was Ed Barker. <laughs> Ed Barker was getting ready for an audition, and he he was on the road. He had, and I heard about him. I heard that he had won that Chicago Symphony, and then uh, he was like third chair. And then he he auditioned, and he won that audition mm-hmm. the next day, literally. And uh, well, the same thing happened. Uh, we had the Woody Herman and the Thundering Herd came through, and they they did a concert there. And again, I ran into the bass player practicing, and uh, and he was getting ready. He he was playing his upright, and I said, "Hey, that's cool. What are you working?" I said, "Well, I got this audition tomorrow." I said, well, "Who's that with?" His name. Uh, the uh, he had to audition for Bill Evans. Oh, well, the guy that was that actually won the audition that was Mark Johnson. Oh wow! So that's when I met cool. Mark Johnson. <laughs> and all these guys, have, you know, they've come full circle because I had, when I did the Austin 86 convention at, at my second year, that's when I invited uh, Mark Johnson to come. And we were, it was kind of, he was kind of reluctant to come because his uh, sister had been killed in a car accident. They were real oh, really? close. Okay. And, but he came and he was, he was just an unbelievable guy. Just kind of quiet, but I mean, he was just into... The music and he just had so much to share and you know rufus was there there wow. david gage came out uh we just had it was just so many memories and we could spend a whole another hour i told I you I, I have a zillion of stories <laughs> i'm trying to hit all the highlights <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful thing about these is they can always be around two and around three and so okay all always, right all it's right. an open invitation two i was talking two. with i was talking with frank frodo and i mean you know we started talking and we're sure. like we've covered one percent maybe you know we like talk for like an hour like 
Yeah. So it's so it's uh, it's amazing though. Like sitting around, you know, like this table today. We're like and just like all the those connections, like you're describing, like to 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 Barry, to Jeff, to Gary. Right? It's it's it really is. It's a small world. Anyway, and in the base world, right. you know, particularly so. Well, one of the things I remember doing, which I really am so glad I did, and it was a turning point in my life, was when I asked, uh, we had these residency programs, and we could bring in uh, very famous people for a week. And it actually paid, you know, some money. Yeah. Plus all their expenses. Well, my suggestion, because I, w- I was, uh, I became head of the string area I said well why don't we have uh, this guy uh, Francois Rabat hey so uh-huh. Francois we invited him out and this was like 1995 first time he came out and there's a YouTube video that you've probably seen where Francois is playing Pucha Das mm-hmm. with Sukhvinger Singh who is a tabla player mm-hmm. and this is again totally by chance it was the last day it was a friday um it happened we had another guest artist this sue finger who was there with the, they have a uh, really a neat uh, middle eastern program steve slavic who was a he was a protege of uh, ravi shankar okay yeah. plays sitar mm-hmm. and uh, his wife's indian i mean just a beautiful guy uh, so many cool people there in Austin. Um, anyway, he was having, Suk Vinger was there, Tabla player. Well, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if the two of them got together? So that morning, they were ha- he was doing a, a percussion workshop, and then Francois was doing the, the bass. And I asked Francois, would you mind you know, meeting him? And so it was 9 o'clock in the morning. I just happened to have, a, I had an 8 millimeter camera, mm-hmm. a video. And uh, I, so I, they met, never played together, and I recorded that. And I put oh, it on cool. YouTube. So you can, if you haven't seen it, go to I my, haven't seen it. I will check it go out. Go to though. my YouTube yeah. channel, uh, BD Newbert, mm-hmm. at you know, YouTube, whatever. Yeah. And... Uh, it's on there and it, it's gotten a bunch of hits and I I hesitated to put, post it because well first of all the internet wasn't around mm-hmm. when this all happened mm-hmm. and uh, but I kept that video and I, and I told Francois you know I would never you know put anything without his right, right. permission you know I guess it'd been long enough so I went ahead and put it up there and I'm glad I did because yeah. a lot of people got to see it but that kind of opened up you know the world with the uh, all the video stuff that's been going on it's remarkable how that how that's oh, you know I've lived through the whole the whole thing you yeah. know from the analog to the digital right and yeah. I did that thing oh yeah I mentioned Dartmouth College mm-hmm. in 19 uh, summer of 1980 I got a grant was it 1980 no it was must have been later you know, I was at Wichita that's right I was in Wichita I was still teaching so I got a summer grant to go study with uh, John Appleton mm-hmm. and it was a, called Music and Technology and it was a really cool seminar because it was like looking forward oh cool here we are now, this is we were transitioning from the analog into the digital well John Appleton is known for the Synclavier mm. he, mm-hmm. he, he helped develop that and that was the first digital is 16 bit man that's 16 bit that's digital remarkable synthesizer. yeah and so I made I I met, I couldn't help myself. I had to mess around with it. So I was there at the seminar, and, and there was another guy there, uh, Louis Christensen, and Louis was uh, he was from Seattle, yep. and he had this uh, magazine. It was called New Music West, and it was all contemporary music. Well, he was a pianist. He was a jazz pianist. So we would get together and we would jam. Every day we would play stuff and we just for fun, just for ourselves. Yeah, we, yeah. we were in well on the way out when I was leaving that seminar. There, here I'm carrying a bass out, and here's this guy coming in. He has a bass. We just sat and we shook hands with Dave Holland. Oh, <laughs> I can't wow. do that. So I met Dave Holland. It, it's just it's a small world. Yeah, it yeah. really is amazing. The, the paths of our lives, you know, like intersecting like that. It really is a small world. Yeah. That's that's. That's exciting. 
Man, well, you got to come back on for a round two, <laughs> for sure. This is our round three because we were chatting today earlier, but this is, it's an open invitation. It's never a one and done yeah. deal. It's, it's, fun, it's fun to sit down and chat and then like anything specific coming up or you're putting an article out or anything like that. I love to like dig, into, dig into that. So yeah, anything you want included with this too, like anything you were talking about, like article wise or anything, you know, like that you want me to link up to, I will happily okay. do that. All right. Well, I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I appreciate you taking the time and, and doing that. And thanks for thanks for thinking of me for the this panel too. That was a, a ton of fun and really. I, well, you know, one of the reasons I got inspired to do this is I kept hearing all my students on your. <laughs> your I, mean, I think Kelly was on it. Kelly yeah, Wall, yeah, yeah. model, and yeah. uh, and he's written some pieces, uh-huh. a lot of stuff. We just call him Kelly. Kelly, okay. That's why, that's it. <laughs> that's his familiar name. Okay, I was wondering, because I've only ever heard P. Kelly Quattle. I know, I know. David, thanks for taking the time. So great to chat with you. And thanks for inviting me to moderate the making of the ISB panel. It was great to hang out in person. I think the last time I saw you in person, I was 18 or 19 years old. So it's great to catch up and great to get you on the show. And if you'd like to follow along with everything else we're talking about here these weeks about the ISB, the ISB convention, the history of the ISB, go to ContraBaseConversations.com slash ISB. And you can share that link or any link out to your friends, to your colleagues, to your students. That would be the best thing you can do for this show to help spread the word and help reach more people in this community of ours. I am so thankful that you're listening along. I appreciate it. I know David appreciates it. And I can't wait to bring you more of this coverage of ISB 2017 here on Contrabase Conversations, your source for life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs>